Today for the sermon, Breaking the Silence, we're going to return to Luke chapter 1 in our sermon series on Luke and specifically read through to begin with some verses that we've already looked at in depth and I preached on at the beginning of this year and the beginning of this month. Uh, we're going to turn back to Luke chapter 1 verses 5 through 20 because it's important and it helps us then understand what's happening where I'm going to pick up the story. We're going to pick up the reading at Luke 157. So here now God's word. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiah. So he's a Levite, he's a priest, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. That means she's from a priestly family also. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But, but... They had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division, one of the 22 divisions, was on duty for a week in Jerusalem, according to the custom of the priesthood, he, Zechariah, was chosen by Lot to enter the temple of the Lord. This is the actual house of the Lord, the holy place, right in front of the Holy of Holies. One priest goes in there uh, two times a day. Okay. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him, to Zechariah, inside the holy place, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. In other words, by God. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him, before the Lord their God, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, according to what, how, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring to you this gospel, this good news. And see, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Now, holding that thought, let us move ahead. Elizabeth became pregnant after Zechariah returned home. He's deaf, he's mute. Mary's come, visited, stayed with Elizabeth after Elizabeth was in total seclusion for five months heading into her sixth month. Elizabeth's in some kind of semi-seclusion when Mary's there, but all of a sudden now, Verse 57, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. Literally, in the Greek, the time was fulfilled. You need to pick that up from the previous reading and think about Mary's giving birth to Jesus too. Now, the time was fulfilled for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. 
And on the eighth day, this is the day under the covenant for the circumcision, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he, Zechariah, asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all marveled. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came upon all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And then finally, we'll come back to the Benedictus next Sunday, but we do need to read the closing verse here for today's purposes, verse 80 of chapter 1. And the child, not the man now, the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness, the Eremos, the desert, the Judean desert, until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. New mom. New mom. First time mom. What's a typical dynamic? When Nancy was pregnant for the first time, looked very, you know, petite and young, all kinds of folks that she didn't know from Adam would approach her in grocery stores, out on the street. Some of them would boldly, even without permission, touch her pregnant you know, Tommy, and, and start giving all kinds of advice and, and, and uh, uh, prophesying about given how the pregnancy was configured, you know, whether this was going to be a girl or a boy, we didn't know at the time, but, you know, all kinds of advice, all kinds of, you know, and family and friends and neighbors, are you kidding? They're constantly laying on all the advice you could ever possibly absorb and more. Everyone, this is the way the world works, everyone has an opinion about your child. When the child is coming, what the child is going to be like, what you need to do with the child when the child's a baby, and then all throughout their life. Everybody, they, they may kind of fade back from always saying it to your face, but everybody's got opinions about your child. Parents, do you understand this? Everybody, every member of the family, everybody who knows you, everybody who inter intersects with your child has all kinds of advice and opinions about your children. And definitely for that poor first-time mom uh, giving birth. So this raises the question, when should I not do what everyone says I must do? When should I not do what everyone says I must do? When should I break with what we always do? This is what we always do. You know, the famous last words of the dying church are, we've never done it this way before, right? So when should I break with what we always do, what everybody does? Part of our message here today for application for all of us is Christians, and definitely, yes, a little kind of particular focus for parents is, Zechariah and Elizabeth respond in a distinct way to family traditions, cultural customs, uh, religious expectations, Zechariah and Elizabeth seek to obey God. What a thought. They seek to obey God. So if you're following along with the notes, and the notes are uh, basically give you some idea of what we're doing today. They can help you with your home study. Uh, if I correct something up here, make sure you correct it on your notes. But the first blank here, Zechariah and Elizabeth, what do they do with family traditions, with cultural customs, with religious expectations? What do they do? They upend. They upend 
family traditions. They upend cultural customs. They upend religious expectations. Why? If they did that just to kind of assert themselves or burn down the house, that's not productive. That could be of the devil, okay? <laughs> We're not saying just, you know, confound customs just for the sake of confounding customs. Start the revolution, bring it on. That's not what we're talking about. What are they up to? They upend family traditions and religious expectations and cultural customs in order to obey God. They are under God and trusting in God in doing this. Zechariah and Elizabeth trust themselves and their son. Parents, do you hear that? That's, that's, that gets kind of tricky. They trust themselves and their child, John, to God's grace and rule instead of people's grace, people's approval, and people's rule. Well, wait a minute, I got to do what my family says. I got to do what my best friends say. Well, maybe not. Which choice do you make? But everybody else is doing this, Mom, and you say, well, you don't have to do what everybody else does, and then you turn around and do what everybody else does. Kind of a little double standard hypocrisy stuff going on here? Yep. In the case of Elizabeth and Zechariah, they seek God's grace and rule instead of people's favor or approval and rule. You're going to end up in one camp or the other. Which will it be? Now, uh, let's talk about what's happening in this scripture more broadly. Remember, we've talked about this already. There's been silence for 400 years. Silence from God. Let me clarify this. There's a lot of noise on the ground, and there's particularly, this is historically validated, and we know this, and it's all infused into the New Testament Gospels. There's a lot of noise on the ground. There are a lot of people who are religious or political among the Jews who are making a lot of noise in the decades and the century leading up to Jesus' coming. In fact, during the whole 400 years, you know, you got the Maccabean thing, you got all kinds of stuff, but this is... Coming up to Jesus, there are all kinds of prophets who are saying all kinds of stuff. Let's get Israel back. Let's take our nation back. Let's do this. Let's do that. Here's a leader we can all get behind. Maybe he's the Messiah. There's all kinds of false prophets and false messiahs and political partisans. There's the zealots. There's all these different camps. There's the Pharisees. There's the Essenes. There's a lot of noise on the ground horizontally. And we live in days, my, my brothers and sisters, when if you want to open up your smartphone or other electronic devices, you can get prophecies from all kinds of people who are, who are just kind of throwing spaghetti up on the wall to see what might fix. This person's going to be in the White House, this. This person's going to do this. This is going to happen here. Here, you've got it coming. You know, all this disaster, and then we'll win this way. And is it of God? Well, according to biblical standards, you've got a lot of false prophets and false prophecies that under Old Testament standards, now we're New Testament people, that would have been stoned years ago, several years ago. And some of them reemerge after being incorrect in the 80s, 90s, and early part of this century. I mean, it's very interesting. Yeah, there was a lot of noise on the ground, but there was silence from God for over four centuries. No actual word from God. And then God sends his angel to this old righteous priest with a barren wife who's a type of Israel. Model, like in a negative way, but he's going to turn positive now. Fear not, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name. What was he supposed to call him? Everybody remember? Can anybody fill in that blank on the sermon notes? I hope you got that point. What's he supposed to call him? Martin? Zechariah Jr.? What's he supposed to call him? John. John. And you remember, I dug into this at the beginning of this year with that earlier sermon. What does Yohanan mean? What does Yohanan mean? What does John mean? The Lord is gracious. 
or the Lord's gracious gift. The Lord's gracious gift. Hold that thought. Let it totally help you understand what is happening here. And then remember that speaking of the 400 years, the last prophet of Israel who's hearing from the Lord and speaking actually the word of the Lord instead of, you know, kind of partisan babble, it's like human produced, like so-called stuff, is a guy named Malachi. And in the last chapter of the book of Malachi, basically Malachi's last words, Malachi says that the Lord himself is going to come and that there's going to be this great and terrible day of the Lord. But in advance of that, the Lord will send Elijah. And Elijah will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and there'll be this return of repentance. And you better return to repentance. You better return to the Lord, by the way, because it's going to be an awesome and terrible day when the Lord comes. It's, it's a day of, of, of light and darkness, of, of right and wrong. Now, Zechariah is supposed to know all that, Surely in his head, at least, he knows this. I mean, he's a priest. He's a righteous priest. So he knows the prophecy, and he knows what Gabriel is telling him is like, yes, there's about to be a fulfillment in Malachi chapter 4. And yes, there's about to be an end to the silence. And yes, this son you're going to have is going to be the great prophet after 400 years of silence. Zechariah is supposed to remember all that. He's supposed to remember... But he's the type of Israel, right? And, and Israel has a, a really good job of kind of like what they do is they set up all their regulations and the way they do church or synagogue or the temple all the time, and they do it their way, but they're not actually listening to God or remembering actually what the covenant is about. Do you know anybody like that? There's a lot of people who go to church that are like that. There are a lot of people who don't go to church like that, but will tell you they're a Christian because they got their thing worked out with God. Yeah, yeah. The Lord remembers his covenant. But ironically, this is part of the humor, right? Zechariah does not. Remember I told you what Zechariah's name means? Zakar in Hebrew means remember. The Lord remembers. That's what Zechariah means. That's what that name means. But Zechariah himself, he's not so good. And if he's got it in his head, he doesn't really have it in his heart even though he's righteous before the Lord. See, you will be silent, Gabriel says, when Zechariah says, by what am I going to know this? I, I mean, I'm the judge of all things. I decide whether God can do something or not. So by what am I going to know this? Give me a sign. I, I just don't see it happening. See, you will be silent and will not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, in other words, in the time God says. Now, again, fast forward, here we are, Elizabeth. Now, this has been one of the weirdest pregnancies recorded in all human literature. Uh, you know, she's too old to have a baby. She's long past her cycle. Now she's pregnant, and she goes into seclusion for five months. This is what Luke tells us. She's in seclusion for five months. In the six months, she comes out of seclusion so that Mary, that's just had, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Okay. Mary, the, the young maiden, uh, comes and visits with Elizabeth for three months. So it, it seems like Elizabeth is still in semi-seclusion. you got two pregnant women, one early pregnancy, one late pregnancy. And uh, Elizabeth is not out at the supermarket of you know, the Judean hill country to be kind of exposed to all the people who want to come up and give her advice. But man, as we move right to the... the, the the delivery, things open up, it's public. She has the baby, and we're told, Luke tells us, that all the family and the friends and all the people with great advice descend to rejoice with Elizabeth. The time was fulfilled. It placed the, it was fulfilled for her to give birth, and she bore a son. Now remember, poor old Zechariah, talking about a weird pregnancy. The guy has not been able to speak, and apparently he's deaf too. That's the language that Luke used back 
early in one, and all this sign language stuff indicates, yeah, he's, 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 he's deaf as well as mute. Um, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. But many will rejoice at the child's birth. And she bore a son. This brings us to another critical issue of our faith. Not receiving a gift that you really want, what you really want in your life, whether that's a marriage, a child, a career, tenure at Mississippi State University or something like that. Um, not receiving a gift that we greatly desire and pray a lot about can be a crisis of faith. That's one kind of test. But did you know that receiving the gift is another kind of test? When you actually receive the gift, it may be the more challenging test. What will we do once we have the gift in hand? Is the gift ours or God's? And are we still looking up to God or are we going to worship the gift? Are we going to idolize the child? the marriage, the career. Who really is our God? Who's the love of our heart? The gift or the gift giver? This is a big issue because you know we are saved by God's grace through faith, not by the gifts, not by the gifts we can hold in our hands. So we've got an issue of potentially forfeiting grace, God's grace, depending on how we handle the gift. Uh, we can either idolize the gift, or by the way, sometimes it's kind of odd, but some people are like this. They get what they supposedly just desperately desired, and then it's kind of like, yeah, well, it wasn't quite what I expected. Uh, it's a pain. I don't like having to have this child. I don't like having to have this marriage. I don't like having to have this job. So then I abuse it. That's also sin. Um, what will I do once I have my child, my gift? So the, the crowd comes around, and, you know, these people are well-intentioned. Let's give them their due. Uh, but let's also be aware of this. Let's be aware of this with well-intentioned people in our lives. Do you know what the road to hell is paved with? Anybody know? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well-intentioned folks, all kinds of advice. They were calling him Zechariah. The Greek here literally is, I mean, it's imperfect, and it's already been happening apparently since his birth is the way I would I just kind of read between the lines here. I mean, from his birth and heading into this circumcision, they were calling. I mean, the people have taken over. We voted. We all agree. His name is Zechariah. Classically in the tradition, it would be the grandfather, but in this case, grandfather's dead. Zechariah is so old, he's like a grandfather. That seems to be what's going on here in the cultural dynamic. But his mother said, the child's mother said no. She stood against all her, you know, aunts, uncles, friends, neighbors, best friends, and said no. He will be called John. Remember what that name means. The Lord is gracious or the Lord's gracious gift. So now, that having failed with Elizabeth, what do crowds do? What do family members do? What do children do when they don't get their way with one parent? You go to the other one, right? So, you know, this is the weirdest thing, and this guy doesn't know how to be a dad. She obviously doesn't know how to be a mom. She didn't have a child when she should have, and we really got to help her out. But she's not taking our advice, so we got to go to old Zechariah and get his buy-in to this sometime before he dies, because he's probably going to die pretty soon. I mean, he hasn't been able to speak or, or hear anything, for, and he's old anyway. But let's kind of work him. So they go over to Zechariah, and they start motioning to Zechariah. You know, and he motions, because he can't hear, apparently, too, and can't speak. So he, he motions back to them. He wants a tablet. He gets the tablet, and in the Greek of, of Luke, the order is really decisive here. He actually says, John. It's first word. John is his name. John is his name. And they all marveled. Immediately, Zechariah's mouth is opened, his tongue is loosed. Why? 
He's actually faithful. Wow. Nine months can teach you a lot about faith. Now, you ever been deaf and mute for nine months? Teach you a lot about faith. Teach you a lot about, how many times do you think he's gone over what Gabriel said to him? Two or three times? Like every hour on the hour when he can't go to sleep in the middle of the night? Yeah, it's, 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 it's into him. And then what does he do? What does Zechariah do? Now he can speak. What would you speak? I, I said we should probably do an experiment. Well, I get you all to agree not to say a word for nine months. And to be under kind of the oppressive hand of nine months of silence. Most people that I know would come out saying, man, that was horrible, or woe is me, or whatever. Finally, now I can give Elizabeth a piece of my mind, or, or you guys, I'm going to tell you off, or whatever. Is that what he does? Is he horizontal right now, or is he vertical? What do you think? He's very vertically oriented. First thing he does with his newly opened mouth, breaking the silence, is he blesses God. That's the answer to that blank there. He spoke blessing God, praising God. You could translate that praising God. So Gabriel, what Gabriel has said has come true. You will have great joy and gladness. And fear and awe came on the neighbors. Why? Because God's in charge. Because these people are like sold out to God, and this is totally amazing, and this is almost like we're back in the Bible instead of doing our own little religion and customs. Wow. Fear and all came on all their neighbors. All these things were talked about throughout the Judean hill country. Now, we have not hit all of Israel yet. We've got to wait on the big, like, high-level prophet, John, to come out and speak the word of the Lord. But Elizabeth and, and Zechariah are prophesying kind of more at that Joel level. Um, all who heard these amazing things laid them up in their hearts. Remember that, because that's what... Mary's going to do too. You lay up things in your heart. And they were asking all kinds of questions. They asked, what then will this child become? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Now let's go to parenting. I have not done this class yet in Christian parenting or biblical parenting, but perhaps we should. Notice the parenting style of this old couple. And we don't know how long they live beyond this, you know, but uh, can you just imagine the conversations? You know, the young mom's talking about, well, my eighth grader's in the band now. Well, my eighth grader is over at uh, the academy and is on the debate team. Well, my seventh grader is going to be on the soccer team this year. Well, mine's about to go to camp for three weeks, and I just don't know what I'm going to do because I always have my children with me, and I don't know how they're going to survive and how I'm going to survive to be away from them for three weeks. Wow. Uh, Elizabeth... How's old John doing? I, I didn't see him at the soccer practices. I didn't see him at the band rehearsal. But yeah, he's, he's out living in the Aramos, in the desert. He, you know, we see him a couple times a year. He's out there eating locust and already working on his camel's hair clothing. I mean, notice, this is the child now. This is not the man, the child, according to Luke 180. Uh, maybe we should discuss a little more rangy, spirit-filled parenting styles in our church, according to Luke 180. I mean, you want to talk about breaking customs. This is breaking customs, breaking the silence. And I want to invite you to open yourself to God's inspiration, to consider how. Now, this is not about your self-assertion. If it's of the flesh, it's no good. It's not about false prophesying, not about any of that stuff. But if God moves in you to be set free by his grace, your relationships and parents, your parenting should reflect that. Don't forfeit the grace that God has given you. Be new. That's what we're called as Christians to be like. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed. Wait a minute. I thought we are supposed to be conformed to this world. Nope. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Not people's wills, God's will. What is good and acceptable and perfect. 
Jesus says, this is a tough one, we'll get back to this eventually in Luke. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, that's Jewish hyperbole. What that means is there's total, God's the whole thing. You know, I don't do what my family says. I do what God tells me to do. Um, Hate his mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Are you a disciple? Are you actually in Christ? I want to invite you to that, to to live by the Holy Spirit. Jesus also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Are you drunk on old stuff? Are you in the Holy Spirit? This is the calling. This is, and you see this laid out in the decisions we make, in the fruitfulness or lack of fruitfulness. And ultimately, we're talking about the grand royale, Satan versus God's spirit. To fill in the blank if you need it, Satan has a field day with predictable rebellion and religion and specifically predictable man-made rebellion and religion. Yeah, he has a field day with man-made sin. I mean, he can totally do that. Okay, you've got these lusts or these addictions or this, that, you know, these needs, these fears. I can work with that, Satan says. But you know what? Satan also, this is all through the Bible, has a field day with man-made religion too the good people, not just the wild people. Are you an easy read for Satan? Get set free by the Holy Spirit. Satan cannot take on the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's no no comparison. Well, what does it mean to be a person of the Spirit, to be born again? Jesus says, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone. I mean, every true Christian, everyone born of the Spirit. Satan can't put an easy read on you. The culture can't put an easy read on you. The crowd can't. So today, the gospel invitation is to break silence. And what are we supposed to declare? my personal screed, my personal emotions. No, 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 no. Break silence and declare God's grace. The Lord is gracious. And bless the Lord. Everything you have, all that you are, bless the Lord. Parent differently. Shepherd your child. How? Shepherd your child in the Holy Spirit according to the Spirit-inspired Word. And I don't mean just a couple key verses that everybody slaps on slogans. I mean the kind of Word that we just worked our way through. And may the Lord's hand be with your child. Trust in and declare the Lord's grace. Break the silence. And I promise you this. People will marvel, and some will be in awesome fear because the Lord's hand of grace will be on you and your household. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.